Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Tapraskis with Xamarin University. Thank you very much for joining us today. We have Liam Cavanaugh uh, on the Azure Search team to talk to us today about Azure Search. Please take it away, Liam. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining me today. I, I'm really excited. This is the first time that I've done a, a guest lecture on uh, Xamarin University. And uh, so just to give a little background, I am, as Mark mentioned, um, on the Azure Search team. I work in the engineering organization, and I'm a program manager. My goal today is to help you understand how to integrate a really great search experience into your uh, mobile Xamarin applications. And I'll kind of go through and help you understand, you know, why that makes sense, why we're seeing this more and more in mobile applications. Um, and just to kind of set expectations, I'm certainly, you know, not going to go through a lot of the, you know, the basics of creating a Xamarin application, just kind of assuming that you have a good background on that and show you how you can then extend that application to do some of these uh, interesting search-enabled capabilities. So if, if you look at a couple examples here, um, let me just show you some that you know are very common applications and you know you'll think about all of your favorite ap applications on your smartphone you know think about how many of those have some sort of search aspect to it you know we look at this one on the left side this Netflix where you want to search for video content it's a great way for you to you know start doing this idea of type ahead or suggestions so as people are looking for content, they can bring up back relevant results. Uh, a lot of times what we'll see in these search-enabled applications is the idea of not only being able to do full-text search, but also being able to filter or uh, sort or facet, categorize that data. And finally, in this third one, you know, if we look at Redfin, which is a real estate site, there's a lot of applications that leverage geospatial in conjunction with full text search. So here's a really great example where in Redfin, what it lets you do from your smartphone is just draw in a little polygon of an area you're interested in. So if I wanted to search for homes using full text search, but then limit results using geospatial, it's a really, really convenient thing to do. So that's really what I'm talking about today. Uh, Azure Search is a platform as a service. Our goal is to make it really easy for you to build out these great search experiences into mobile applications without necessarily having to be an expert in that field. So when I talk about you know, a great search experience, what I'm talking about is you know, not just simple words. Like you can imagine, and most people think of full text search as something that if a user gives me a word, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look through my data and try to find an exact match to that. And that, sure, that's, that's a very small piece of full text search, but what's happened is that because people have become so accustomed to using technologies like Google and Bing every single day, uh, what happens is that uh, you they have a certain level of expectation on search. So it has these ideas that if I misspell a word, it's going to handle that. If I don't get the right term, you know, handling synonyms, different forms of those words, you know, being able to categorize and drill into that data is really, really critical. And that's, you know, just a start of what we're looking to be able to enable in Azure Search. And one thing I, I forgot to mention early on is that I do have a couple of people online. So if you do have some questions as we go through, feel free to just put it into the, uh, the chat window there. And we'll also try to leave some time at the end to open up for questions if we want to have another discussion. So apologies for, for, for getting that early on. But hopefully you've, you're starting to see, you know, the real value of search. It's a new valuable way to allow your users to explore your data. And that's really what we're trying to do. So what I'm going to walk through as a start is how to actually get your content into this Azure Search service and start doing some of the queries. Now we have four steps as a typical workflow of how to set up a system. First, you create your Azure Search service. And this is really just a matter of deciding which of our Azure data centers you want to place that service in. Uh, it's deciding which tier 
uh, or SKU you want to use. We have everything from a free tier that allows you to try everything for free all the way up to a really high-end tier that can handle thousands of queries per second. So it's a very, very scalable system. The other thing that we'll talk about in a minute is this idea of putting data into an index. An index is like your container for your data. If you've ever used something like SQL Server uh, or some other SQL databases, you'll know the concept of a table as the container for your data. It's a very, very similar concept for us. Just like in a table, we have fields in the index. Uh, those fields have properties. For example, it's full text searchable, or you can actually sort or, or filter it. Uh, and then we have rows, or what we call documents. All of these things uh, are then searchable through the Azure search. And that's what we're going to walk through. So let me switch over to my, my portal here and hopefully give you an idea of how to get this going. So what you're going to need to do uh, to actually use Azure Search is to create a new service. And if you've never used Azure before, uh, you can sign up for a free account. Just search for Azure uh, free uh, sign up or account, and it'll walk you through and give you a free account to try. And then once you have this and you've gone to our portal, uh, which is portal.azure.com, what I can do is I can click on new here and actually search for the Azure Search Service. So of course, of course, search is in here even, in this spot right here. So I can choose Azure Search, and what this is going to do is walk me through the steps of actually going to create this search service. So let me choose it. Choose Azure Search. Uh, yep, that description looks good. I want to create a new search service. And then I start defining all of the attributes. For example, uh, create a resource group that allows me to link all of my Azure resources together, which data center we want to put it in. Uh, I can choose a different pricing tier. So as I mentioned, we have everything from a free service that is limited in the number of content you can put in. You can see you can only put in 10,000 items. But it has all so you can try it and then grow as you need to up to some of our higher end tiers. So I've already created a search service, uh, so we're just going to go to that and do it. Um, if you're actually walking through this, uh, one of the things that I will point out is that, you know, I'm going to go through this somewhat quick, uh, but one of the things that you might want to do if you want to drill into this more is if you go to my GitHub site right here, and I'll just bring it up. If you go to this part, and I actually included a link in the presentation. Uh, what I have is my, all of the code, all the source code, including uh, videos that walk through this, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, plus a lot more detail on how to build a, an application. And as you can see, I have a, a lot more videos. So feel free to check this out. And if you're, you can't keep up with it, just uh, you, know, you can go through here as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my service here that I've previously created. This is called Real Estate. And what my goal today is to build out an Android application that allows me to search real estate listings. So this is going to have a search page to it. It's going to allow me to do that type ahead. Uh, it's going to allow me to search and get the results back. And then also to also page through those items. So you'll see here in my search service, I've actually already created a couple of indexes. And you see here I have one that's uh, called listings, which has 5 million uh, houses in it. And we'll actually use this uh, for my demo just because it's a bigger one. But if you want to give us a try, all you need to do is you click on import data. And there's a number of different ways that you can get data into Azure Search. If I choose connect to your data, what I can do is we have crawlers for a whole bunch of different common stores. Azure SQL, SQL Server on VM, DocumentDB, blob storage, so if you happen to have documents like PDFs and Office and HTML and you want to search that content, with that text content in those files, we can crawl those storage, table storage, and if you have a store other than this, you can also push content into Azure Search. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this samples data source right here. And what we have is a simple uh, real estate listings data set. 
This is going to be 5,000 house listings, so it fits very nicely into the free uh, search tier. Uh, and it's for the King County, Washington area. So I'm going to choose that. If I was choosing Azure SQL, it would ask me for my connection information. And what we're going to do is whenever we connect to that data store, we try to figure out what is the best uh, schema for that. So let me just call my li index listings. Uh, Xamarin. And we define what is the unique that key for that. We also see that here's a whole bunch of different fields, right? We have the listing ID, the number of bedrooms, which is an integer, a description of the home. We have description in multiple different languages, uh, and we'll see why that's important later. Uh, square feet. We also have down at the bottom here, uh, location, which is longitude and latitude, that allows me to do geospatial spatial searching. And then once I've defined all the fields, what I can do is I can set the attributes. So retrievable, what this means is that when somebody executes a search against Azure Search, that means that this field can be returned back to the user. Like sometimes you might have fields, like maybe it's a margin that, you know, if you're selling products, you might want to use margin to help score or tune the results that come back, but you probably don't want your users to see it. So I can set that to not be retrievable. Filterable and facetable usually go hand in hand. A facet is a way of categorizing data. So for example, let's say that I'm searching for homes in Seattle, and I want to show a breakdown of the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. What we'll do is search engines are really, really good at calculating these counts. So I can say search for homes in Seattle and then, or that have the word Seattle in it, and then do number of homes that have five bedrooms, four bedrooms, three bedrooms, et cetera. That's a facet. And then once I then let the users then filter that and say, okay, now limit the results where it has these words and there are more than four bedrooms, let's say. Sorting, you know, that makes sense. That's how I can sort the results. And finally, being able to do full text search. So do I want to be able to do full text search against these fields, yes or no? You'll also notice here, there's another tab called analyzers. And in the search world, an analyzer, you can think of it as being something that allows you to take the words that come in from the user and analyze it and try to figure out what is the most relevant result. And this is where it gets really interesting because if you think about it, if I put in the word, you know, Seattle, you know, I can try to find different results where that word comes into play. But where it gets a lot more difficult and where this, you know, Google or Bing-like search experience is really important is where you need to deal with the unique aspects of every different language. If I look down here, you'll notice how I've assigned to the different fields, the English, uh, the, or sorry, the German, the French, Italian, we have different analyzers we can use. Now, one of the things that we have, as Microsoft have added is this natural language analyzer. And what it does is it has a very deep understanding of over 56 different languages. And this is a technology that's been used in Bing, uh, it's been used in Office for well over 16 years. So what we can do is we can do some really interesting things. Like imagine if somebody was searching for the word mouse, you know, and in that content it's, it's actually referred to as mice. You know, it's a variation to the word. We call it lemmatization. And because we really deeply understand the language, we can see those variations and be able to bring back results. Similarly, you know, if you look at uh, other languages, German, you know, handling decompounding of words, you know, condo versus apartment, you know, all those variations are, are really tough to do. Uh, but that's something that you just get out of the box by using this analyzer. And then you can do things like stemming, different forms of words like run, runner, running, and do those aspects as well. So analyzers are really important because it's a really simple step for you to add to allow your users to find relevant content, even if it isn't an exact match for that user. So the final thing that I'm going to show you here before I actually go and create the index is the idea of type ahead. So we're going to see in a, in a few minutes in the Xamarin application I'm building that 
as people are searching for houses, what I want them to do is as they're typing into that search box to give them some viable um, options as to what they might be looking for. Just kind of type ahead into that search box so that they can quickly get to the content. And what we're doing is we're creating a suggester, uh, and I just call it SG. And what I do down here is I say, okay, which fields do I want to do that type ahead? So if they start typing in a number, a house number, maybe that's a good suggestion. Maybe a street name, the city, the region, uh, postal code, things like that are nice fields for me to allow my, my user to start doing type ahead over. So that's all I need to do. I'm going to click on OK. And finally, it's going to say, OK, how do I, or do you want me to actually import the data? So I'm going to call it my indexer, listing Xamarin. And normally, if you're connecting to a data store, you could schedule this. You could make it so it checks for changes every uh, five minutes, you know, however often you want it to, to check. And it'll find those changes. Since this is just a, a sample data set, uh, there is no scheduling uh, because the data doesn't change. Uh, but I will click on OK and start bringing in some of that data. So at this point, what our crawler or our indexer is doing is it's connecting to that backend store and actually bringing the data and bringing it into your Azure search index. So at once it's all ready to go, you're going to be able to then start doing searches. So what I'm going to show you is a couple of things that we're going to need to start creating some of those these, uh, these queries. So I'm going to go into my uh, Xamarin index here, click on it here. Uh, it'll probably have the data ready in a second. I can click on Search Explorer and start executing some searches. You'll see since we our service is very API-oriented, it's a REST-based API, request against my search service. I'm going to use this index I just created, and I can do a search. So if I say, you know, I want to change it to search equals Seattle, and assuming there's data in it, we should see some data that comes back from it. So here we have a one JSON item uh, that has the results, and you can see Seattle was pretty relevant in here. We have a good example, and I can start doing different searches, like maybe instead of Seattle, I'm looking for homes in Redmond, uh, which is a city I'm, I'm in. And you see how quickly it brings back these results, regardless of what types of words I, I put in. So I'm going to copy this URL, because we're going to use this in a second. I can just copy that, and if I go over here, there is a button here called Keys. Now, I'm not going to click on it because it will actually show my administrative key. Uh, this is my authentication key to actually allow me to get access to my uh, search service. But you can also create query keys. And one of the things that I can do is I can then put it into a tool such as Chrome Postman. Chrome Postman, uh, if, if you've never used it, it's a really nice tool for, for developers to try out make REST API calls. And what I can do here is I can just paste in exactly what I had into my search service. I can see here that I, I have an API version, or Azure Search API version we're using, and here is the search text that I'm going to execute. And if I look at the headers, uh, and what I can put here is here's my query API key. And by the way, if you want to give this a try, this is a query key, so feel free to, to use it if you like. Uh, but I can start doing that exact same search that we just looked at before and start seeing the results for it. And if I change this to uh, Seattle, I'm going to be able to see those search results. So before I jump into the application, let me show you a couple of other things that we're going to be leveraging here. First of all, you know, one of the things that you can do is you can do search for using hit highlighting. So if I bring back the parameters here, you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm searching for the word granite countertop like I'm looking for homes that have granite countertops in it. And I want you to do hit highlighting over the description field. Let's see what that looks like. So if it comes back here, you'll notice that not only do I have the search result, but I also have a hit highlighting that comes back. We bring back a little snippet of text that says, you know, here's where I found granite and countertops in it. And by default, we put these emphasis tags around it, but you could change it to bold or 
uh, you know, underlined or whatever you, makes sense for you. So you can imagine in your search results how you could use that to then highlight to your users the text as to what they search for to help them find relevant results. Remember how I was talking to you about the idea of faceting, um, saying search for the homes in Seattle and show me a breakdown by the number of beds and bathrooms? So if I do a, a search for that, you'll see here that in Seattle, there are 380 homes that have uh, one bedroom. There are 374 that have three bedrooms. And if we go down a little bit more here, uh, we can see the results uh, for bathrooms, as well as all of the search results that come back. So hopefully you can envision, okay, now I want to then let my users not only do searches, but then filter and say, okay, now that they've looked at that, limit it to homes in Seattle that and filter, uh, that should be in dollar filter, sorry about that, change that, and fault filter where the number of bedrooms is greater than three. And you can say equal, less than, less than or equal to, and search that as well. And as you can see here, the number of bedrooms that came back is five, you know, greater than three. So that's perfect. You can hopefully understand how this exploration really makes navigation in mobile applications really easy to do. And hopefully also notice how quickly it was for us to generate those facet counts. Uh, for most data stores, that's actually a really expensive task to do. It's really, really challenging to get that data back quickly. You have to do group buys and counts, uh, which can take time. Whereas for us, it's just fractions of uh, you know, milliseconds to get those results. So those are some good starting points. Now, I'm going to show you a couple other things that you can do that are a little bit more advanced. Do you remember when I was showing you when I created the index? Remember I was showing you the analyzer uh, where I was saying, you know, we can handle different variations of words. If I look at the parameters here, I'm going to just search for the word mice. You know, maybe in searching in houses, maybe that's not a great example. But you can imagine if I'm searching, you see here how this, this house has a small mouse problem to it. You know, even though I search for mice, I was able to find that variation because I'm using the English analyzer. Similarly, if I look at the, uh, German field, this, this word right heel, here, uh, I'm not going to say it because I'll completely ruin it, but this is means con condo or a condominium in German. And if I search the, descript the German description and do hit highlighting over it, what you can see here is even though I did it uh, using that word for condo, it found an alternative for it, which is means apartment in German. So this idea of decompounding uh, is generally very difficult to build out in an application, and we can just leverage it by default. Uh, and there's a lot of other things like geospatial searching. Uh, if I wanted to search and search for everything and limit the results, search that location field, and limit the results to areas that are less than or equal to 10 kilometers from this point. So I can say, you know what, I'm actually interested in Seattle. Or let's put some Amish. And limit the results uh, no, no more than 10 kilometers from that point. We're going to see the results that we have limited. Once again, this geospatial it, part of search is a very efficient task. You can do polygons. Remember in that example where I was showing you the uh, Reddit example, or sorry, Red, Redfin example, where people could draw in a polygon? Well, all I do is take those points and pass it in as a polygon and say, if the data intersects within that point, bring back a result. So we have that here. And we have the items. Once again, came back very, very quickly. So that's enough for now. I Hopefully you get an idea of how you can create an Azure search index and how you can start querying it. So now what I want to do is actually switch over to my Xamarin application and show you how we can now integrate this into an existing application. And to give you an idea, I'm actually going to uh, run this so you can actually see what it looks like right now. It's just got a, a very basic uh, frame to the, to the application. If you go to that GitHub site, that I, uh, I was showing before, 
if you download and, and take a look at the source code for the, the lesson two, which is the first lesson, uh, it has the exact same source code that I'm showing here. And we and there's multiple lessons, so you can actually build out and actually see the, the code by adding more and more pieces uh, as we go. But this should load up, and let me just show you what it looks like. It, it has no search to it yet. It just has the, the back-end UI. So this is the main page that comes up. And what the idea is here is in this little search box, which is one of those auto-suggest uh, controls, what I'm going to do is I want to make it so as they're searching for homes, it gives me a listing set of items to choose. And then when they click on search, it's going to execute the full text search. And we're going to bring back those results into a nice little grid. We're going to show a thumbnail that has the content or, or a picture of the house. It's going to have a kind of a little details in that house. And we're also going to put in paging. So what I can do is I can page forward and backward into results. And then, you know, that'll be the starting point for today. Once again, if you want to look at a lot more other capabilities, uh, I have that GitHub site that go into more details. But let's just get that working and, and see if we can build it out. So the first thing that I want to do is add this idea of type ahead. So I'm going to grab some text, some code, and bring it in and show you how to do this. So what I'm going to do, and I'll walk through everything, I'm going to paste in a little code here and show you what this is. So you remember when I was using that uh, Chrome Postman tool, and you remember that had the API key, the query API key, and I am going to search over an index called real estate. Um, and if you remember back from the portal, this was the actual one that had 5 million items in it. I'm using it just to kind of give you an idea of what the performance looks like when I use a much larger index. And here's the search suggestion that I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the search service to suggest items and limit the results to the top 15. Remember I created the suggestor group called SG, and then I'm going to append whatever they type into the text. So let me just uh, resolve this, because I need to do an HTTP client request. So we have that, so I have all of the code that allows me to make that search request to my search service. So now let me actually make it so that as I type into that, uh, that suggest box, that actually does something. So here, the autocomplete text view, uh, which was from that main page, I'm gonna make it so as the text changes, I'm going to execute the search, and after it's changed, I'm, I'm gonna choose whether I want to display the type ahead search results. So let me grab the code for that. Put that in. And so here, as the text is changing, as long as they're, in, based on what they're typing in, as long as there are uh, three or more characters, because you know if it just types A, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't, you know, that's not gonna really give me a, a viable search suggestion, I'm going to execute a search request, and the results that come back is just a string, and so I'm just going to load those into my my autocomplete text view so that I can actually see it. And assuming that there is actually some results to come back, I actually want to show the dropdown so that I actually show them the data. So now I need to add the code to actually execute the search. So let me grab that. Paste that in. Show you what that looks like. So all I'm doing is using that search service and the suggest URL. I'm taking whatever they type, and I'm going to make a, re a request to Azure Search. Now, luckily, I have this thing called the Azure Search Helper, which helps me execute the REST API calls. I'm just going to include this. It's not really very fancy. All I'm doing is uh, making the REST API call and bringing it back. So I'm just importing that. So if I look at it, you know, all it's doing is it's executing the search, uh, sending this search request, re responding back in JSON format. So take a look at that in a little bit more detail um, when you have more time. That's all it's doing. So I'm getting the search result, and for every suggestion that comes back, I'm adding it to that suggestion list so that I can then display it in the dropdown. Final thing, I just need to initialize the search parameters, and we're all done. So I'm gonna throw this into the on create. So 
The search URI is my search service name, .search.windows.net. I'm going to initialize the HTTP client. I'm going to get my API key and set that. And we're going to do a, just a quick suggestion just to kind of get the cache going, get the, everything writing. So I just need, since this is uh, an uh, async method, I need to add async. So we're done. So I have everything that I should need to actually build out this search suggestion. So at this point, I'm building it. I'm going to deploy the application. And what's going to happen is that uh, it's going to allow me to type into that search box different words and provide suggestions. Let's give that a second. While that's loading, Heidi, are there any questions that uh, we should go through? Uh, there was a question about updating indexers, and mm -hmm. there was another question about NuGet packages, or I assume that's you know, the .NET API. Yeah. So. Okay, so let me, did you answer those, or do you want me to, oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, great. So I think we're all set for that. So now what, what's happened is we have this application, and at this point, I should be able to start typing in things like C Seattle. And you see here how, because we're searching over the city name, the street name, it gives viable results and I can type in Redmond. You know, see here how I, as I'm typing in, the results come back really, really quickly. Search suggestions are a quick way to get viable results, and as I, if I find it and I say, okay, you know what, this is actually one I want to, to use, it's going to bring that and put it into my search suggestion. So then I can search based on those words. It's a really, really convenient and quick way to get some viable content for your users. So that's the first step, so now, I have search suggestions. Now let's go on to the next step and actually execute a full text search um, query into my application. So I'm going to go in and grab some more code. Uh, this time, uh, just like before, I need to create a URL to do my search queries. So unlike before when I was doing a search suggestion, now I'm doing an actual full text search. And what I'm going to need to do is not only am I going to load into the uh, result into a, a, a list listings model, which ha you'll see in a second what that consists of, but that's going to actually be the content that, lo that formats my grid it. And then I'm going to store the search query so that if I ever come back to it, I can just re-query it. Or even for paging, I can use that query term. So that, those are the parameters I need. I'm going to add in a few items here. So if we go on add existing item, there is something called the listing adapter and the model.cs. Now, as I said before, my goal is not really to, to show you, you know, building out a, a Xamarin application. Uh, hopefully some of you that have ever used grids, this will look very familiar. All it's doing is the data co that comes back is going to display that into a grid result. And by the way, uh, I'm going to take the URL that comes back and I'm just going to load up the uh, bitmap image so that it looks a little bit nicer. So that's what the listing adapter does. And the model, all it is, remember list listings? All it is is I'm saying that I'm going to get the ID, the main text, the subtext, and the image URL. And actually that's going to format what's going to be displayed in the grid. So we have that part set up. Now I need to do the code to actually execute the search. So let's change this. Find the search button. There it is. So what we're doing is when they click on that search box, uh, it's going to take the text of whatever they typed in into that search box, and it's going to execute a search. So we need some code for that. So just like the search suggestions, uh, it makes the REST API call. Uh, this one's a little bit more content because there's a little bit for more formatting we're going to do, but let's look at it. So what I'm going to do is take the query, the text that they type in, I'm going to store it into a parameter called store search query so that if I ever want to re-query it, I can do that. I'm going to get the search service URL, and I'm going to create the uh, request here. So I'm going to say, uh, and count. I want to bring back the total number of items that brought back. I want to do paging, so I only want to show in my first page a total of 10 items. I'm going to execute the search, parse the, result, the JSON results to come back, and for every single item, I'm going to do a little bit of formatting. You know, 
set the price and, and the other text that's going to be displayed, set the address, combine it all together, load it into the listings, and then show the results. So we have that, and finally, all I need to do is add in the, the layout for it so that when they actually do it, it actually displays it. So in that list view, I'm going to take whatever I got into my search result and then display it. So let's run this and make sure I got everything going here. I can learn to understand oh. you much better if I can get familiar. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cortana is uh, talking to me here. Here we go. So I'm deploying this application, and now we should have those two steps. We can do the type ahead, and we can actually execute a search. There we go. So I'm going to type Seattle. I'm going to choose Seattle, do a search, and here we see, here we have the search results that come back, right? We have um, a whole bunch of different items, and, in, and just like before, because I'm limiting it to 10 items, uh, we can, we'll only see those results. So that's good. I've shown 10 items, but now what I want to do is be able to page through these results so that if I m move up and forward and backward into that, I can page forward and backward. And so it's kind of a final step for this application. I want to show you how to tie in that idea of paging into it. So let me stop this and then let's add some code for that. So just like before, uh, we need to get, have a few parameters. Uh, it's going to be the maximum number of pages that I will allow a user to, to scroll forward and back. Uh, and the reason why I have that in my example is that if, I, if you search for everything, uh, it can have tens of thousands of pages, because I have five million items in it. So I want to make it so that people can get no more than 20 pages in a search result, and I want to show the current page. So based on what page they're currently at, it's just a parameter that I'm storing. So let's go in there. I'm going to set the current page to zero, because uh, we start at zero, and then go from that point up. And what I want to do is make it so that that seek bar, remember I was showing that paging part there? I'm going to, I'll just lay stings layout. Here it is right here. I'm going to make it so that when I show the listings, what I want to do is for the seek bar, if they, if the progress changes, I'm going to update the text um, to page one, page two, page three. And if they actually let go of it, I want to actually execute a new search but this time, limit the results to the, the current page that they're looking at. So let me get some code for that. This is a little bit more simple code. So as the progress changes, uh, it's going to update the seek bar text to the current page number. So I can kind of really nicely go up and down. But only when I let go of that seek bar do I actually go and execute the search. Um, so if we go back here, I just need to make a few small modifications to that. First of all, I need to append to the parameters here. I want to skip forward a certain number of pages. And keep in mind, since I'm bringing 10 items at a time, what I do is the current page times 10 items. And so that will indicate page 1, page 2, page 3 of uh, the results to get in. And just to, based on how many items come back, I just need to update the maximum page that will be shown into my search results. So let's change that to, to do the search. I'm going to get the document count. So based on what I just searched, how many items are in that result, the maximum page, is, maximum number of pages is however many items divided by 10, plus 1 because it's base 0. And if I need to, I'm going to change the seek bar. If the max page is greater than 20, then I, I set the maximum to, to 20 as well. Or if it's like, say, three or four, I'll set the maximum number of pages to three or four. So I think that's all I needed. Yep, that's done. So now what I can do is execute this application one more time. And now not only will it have the search suggestions, 
the full text search, but I can also do the paging. So I can scroll forward and backwards uh, through those results. So let's give that a second to come back. Here it is. We'll do Seattle again. Choose Seattle, search. And now, uh, if I choose this page, we should see that it goes forward and backward in the results. And you know it's quite quick, right? You see, see how quickly I can get those items, and because we have those, we can get it very, very efficiently. So that's kind of what I wanted to focus on for this part of the, the, the lecture. So hopefully you've seen a couple of different things. Rather than showing you how to integrate the rest of the code into it, uh, please know you can go to that GitHub site and see all of the other things. There's a lot of other uh, videos that show you even more than what I've shown you here. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you through the Chrome Postman some of those other interesting queries that we can do, things that we can do on top of it, as well as some of the analytics that are part of the service. But before I do that, let me just take a second and see if Heidi has any questions. Any questions that have come in? So, yeah, someone did ask about analytics. Oh, great. She should answer, okay. but I don't know if you want to elaborate mm -hmm. on that for everyone else. And then also, do you want to touch on why you're using the HTTP client over .NET for, for this demo? Is there a technical reason, or is it just because it's clearer to see? Yeah, the, so first, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we haven't done all the work to uh, port it, um, our .NET SDK, to work with the uh, Xamarin um, implementation. We are working on that, so that will make it a little bit simpler in the near future to do. The other advantage, right, as of today, which will change uh, soon, is that uh, it allows me to kind of leverage some of the preview features that we weren't previously able to do uh, in the .NET SDK. So there was a lot of other advantages, but that was a main reason. Uh, very soon, please keep an, keep an eye out for our .NET SDK to be part of this as well. But the REST API allows you to do everything. Um, and I'm going to hold off because I will show some of that in a second. Did that, was that all the questions? Okay, great. So let me stop this, and what I want to do is I want to switch back over to uh, the Postman tool, and I want to show you some of the other things that we can do uh, with our full text search. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do show you this idea of fuzzy searching. So what I can do is do a search, and you'll notice, remember I just mentioned, Heidi, talking about our preview API. We have both a GA API and also a preview API. And what we do is as we have new features, capabilities that we want to try out with customers, we, ha we put them into the preview API. So it's not meant for production, but it's a great way of trying out and get feedback. And this is one that we have that we'll actually be putting into our GA API very, very soon. But it uses something called the query, uh, the Lucene query expressions. So what I can do is I can search, only search in the city field, um, and using this Lucene query of full, Lucene query type equals full, I can search for homes in Sammamish. Now let me just do that search right here. And you'll notice that when I executed that search, there were no results that came back. But one of the nice things about this capability is that I can give a hint to the Azure search service that I want you to handle simple spelling mistakes. All I did, was I typed in a, a tilde here, and for those of you that are from the area, you'll notice that I, I misspelled Sammamish, the city of Sammamish. There's actually two M's, it's S-A-M-M-A-M-I-S-H. And if I search for that now, we will then get results that come back, and the, sh the city is probably actually Sammamish. Um, down here, Sammamish, as we see right here. So we do get results. It's a very simple and quick way to actually get me to get those results back. Now, the other things that I wanted to show you is the idea of synonyms. Um, and before I do this, this is actually probably a good opportunity for me to show you the analytics and how we can actually monitor and watch what people are doing and learn from it so that we can improve the, the system. So to do that, uh, let me just close down all of these tabs right here. And in, in order to enable analytics, what you do is you go under all settings here, and there is a feature called search traffic analytics. And what this allows me to do is to optionally log all of the search operations as well as all of the metrics for your service. So what we can do is keep all of this content for a certain amount of days. We put it to your Azure storage account. It's called AZ Search Real Estate. 
is the one that I've created right here. And so what will happen is for operations, every single query, every single search request, every suggest call gets logged with all the parameters to it. And the metrics show you how many queries per second are you seeing? What is the latency? How long is it taking to get those results back? So all of that gets written to a set of JSON files into your storage account. And of course you can do whatever you want with that content. But the other thing we have that's part of Power BI is the ability to then visualize that content. And for any of you that have ever you know, used Power BI, you'll know what I can do here is just click on uh, Get Data. Let me just choose that right now. Choose Services. Find Azure Search. Once this comes up, let's give it a second to load. Or, you know what, let me just go there. So, you see so here we go. You see here, I choose Azure Search, uh, and I'm going to get this. And then it's going to ask me to point to my storage account. All you need to do in this storage account here is put what you had right here, the AZ Search Real Estate, put it right into the Power BI, and say how much data do you want to ingest into that tool, and start importing it. Now, And what you'll get as an output is this visualization right here. Of course all the back-end data is there so you can create your own reports and analytics over it, but what you can see is some interesting data. For example, I can see a lot of the metrics. So this is just a demo, so it's not, you know, not a huge number of searches each day, but as you can see here it does a visualization. The latency, so we can see, here, see the internal time. You know, most of our my queries are no more than around, you know, a couple milliseconds in response time. We can see the query, queries per second. And then from the operations, what we can do is we can d see things like what are the most common things that people are searching uh, against for my system? You know, what are the most common search terms that come, come back um, and bring back the results for that? Which is really useful information, but probably even more useful is this idea of a zero result search query. Uh, this is probably one of the number one frustrations for users that use search enable applications. They put in a word and the search result says there are no results. So this is really, really handy information for you. And there's a statistic that says that for search enabled applications, 70% of all searches are what's called long tail, 70%. What this means is you as a developer you can probably figure out about 30% of the obvious words that somebody's going to search for. But 70% of what people put in, you have no idea. You know, maybe you're selling retail, you know, hardware and you know, you expect them to search for laptop, but you didn't think of netbook or net spacebook or all these different variations. So being able to have that analytics to understand what people are searching for and not getting results, that's a, a great way to help improve your, your user experience. And here's some really odd ones. I don't even know why a lot of these, I assume these are listing IDs. Uh, so maybe what I should do is make my listing ID full text searchable. Uh, you know, I, you know, a bunch of others. I don't know why people are searching for Google in my, my demo, but they are. So, you know, how can I help them find relevant content? Well, let me show you how to do that using synonyms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my portal and what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for homes with waterfronts. And this is interesting, right? Because if you're, you're searching for a, you know, a cottage or a summer, summer cabin or something like that, it's very common to, to use words such as waterfront. But maybe in your content it's not actually referred to as waterfront. Maybe it's lakefront or lake spacefront or seafront or, or lake view or something like that. So how can you then improve your index so that if somebody types that word waterfront, uh, it can bring back a result. And the way that we do that is using something called a synonym map. And if I look at the body for this, you see here I'm going to create a synonym map and what I can do is I can say if somebody types waterfront, that's the same thing as lakefront or lake space front. Similarly, what we've learned in real estate is that it's actually really common for people to search for appliance names. You know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they want a house that absolutely has Bosch appliances in it. What it means is that 
as long as a high-end kitchen, you know, that's what I'm really looking for. So if I put all kinds of different brand names, high-end appliance names, as well as maybe words like stainless steel or other words like high-end, that can help me find a good map to it. So I'm going to send in that cinema map, and now if I search for waterfront, we can now get a result because, as you see here, in the search description, we have that word lakefront. So finding that variation is a very, very attractive way for you to help people get the content that they're looking for. So let me just stop there for a second, and Heidi, tell, can you tell me if there's any other questions that there have come in? There is a question. Okay. It's related to, let me just bring that back, it's related to fuzzy search, and when you post, there it is. Does the response include words that are corrected using fuzzy search so that you could post results that include results for Sammamish? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So if I want to make sure I understand this so that, you know, if it was Sammamish, you know, misspelled, but also Sammamish spelled correctly, I think what he's saying is, do I get both results? And the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's going to give a little bit more weighting. Uh, to results where it did match that, that spelling mistake, but it is going to give, you know, further down in the search results with less scoring, less weighting, are the results that, you know, were the misspelled variations to it. So yes, uh, the answer is yes for that. Was that the uh, main question for that? that? Yeah, that was the last question. Okay, great. So what I wanted to f finish off with before I kind of open up the call uh, for questions is the idea of scoring and tuning. So I'm going to go back over to my portal here and click on the index that we created um, and this is one right here and show you how scoring works. So scoring is a system that allows you to tune or adjust the, the weighting of certain results. If you can imagine, like in this example here, I'm searching for homes, you know, and I might want to make it so that geospatially it makes sense that regardless of what somebody is searching for, if, the, if I know the, the location of that user, and as you know, it's really easy to get the longitude and latitude of the user from the mobile device, I can supply that to Azure Search and say, you know, give more weighting to homes that are in close proximity to that user. Or let's say I was building the next version of Netflix, and I wanted to give more weighting to movies that were five-star, rated as opposed to one star. Or maybe I'm building a document management system where I'm indexing content using the blob indexer. And I want to say, if somebody is searching for an item, give more weighting to an item or a document that was created more recently. You know, so there's a lot of reasons why you might want to tune it. Now, we actually do see that some people actually do uh, tuning for business reasons. Like, imagine that you are sell you're a retail shop and somebody searched for black shoes and you have a thousand different types of black shoes, well, maybe you might want to say, you know what, I'm going to give more weighting to black shoes that have high margins or maybe that I have high inventory on. So if I can pre present relevant information to a user and I make more revenue if they click on that, from a business perspective, it makes sense for me to do that. So scoring can help both from a business perspective, but probably, you know, as importantly, help the overall user uh, user interaction with the system. So let me show you how to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create, create a scoring profile. And let me just see what I called it here. I'm just going to search. It's called scoring test. So I'm going to call it scoring test and click on OK. And what this means is that all of the scoring and tuning that I put within this scoring test tuning profile will affect the weighting. This is not sorting, this is affecting the weighting of the results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, in this example, what I want to do is I want to make it so I'm going to create a function. We have multiple different types. Magnitude uses an integer, and we'll see it in a second, to give more weighting to, you know, higher numbers as opposed to lower numbers. Freshness, you know, using date time to give more relevancy to more, more current items. Distance using geospatial and tags, just saying that if the word, if the document includes this tag or these words, give it more weighting. So I'm going to click on magnitude, and let's say that I want to create uh, a tuning systems for customers that you know are looking for high-end homes. If I determine through personalization that 
generally this person is interested in, in high-end homes. You know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a little bit of boosting. I'm going to say a boosting of five, and I'm going to make it ranging from, you know, one to five homes. And what I do is it linearly degrades. So what's going to happen is going from one to five, or from five to one bedrooms, if it has five bedrooms, that's going to get more weighting than one that has lower. So I'm going to click on OK, save that scoring profile, and now we've added our first function to it. So if I go under here, and let's see if I do it right, let's change it to the right index. And what we can see here is because I referred to the scoring profile called scoring test, I searched for everything, but by default, what I'm doing is I'm giving more weighting to homes that are five, uh, a rating of five or higher. So you know what? That's a great. So let me just make it a little bit more interesting. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that I can execute a, a search. I can pass in my user's longitude and latitude and give that as a boosting to say, you know what, if if that home has five star or sorry, five bedrooms and is in close proximity to where they are, show that first. Show that higher up in the results. So I'm going to add in a new scoring function. I'm going to say I'm going to make this uh, a distance. I'm going to take the longitude location, the location field. I'm going to say let's give it a boosting of five again, and you can play with different different amounts. So I'm going to say as long as it's within 10 kilometers of that location and the parameter where they're going to set the longitude and latitude is current location. And I'll show you that again in a second. So I'll click on OK. And that updates this profile. And as soon as it's updated, any query that uses it will reflect on that. So once again, I'm using the scoring profile. Actually, let me show you the parameters. That's probably easier. So here, I'm using the scoring profile called scoring test. I'm setting the current location to whatever that mobile device user has. And this, by the way, is approximately the location of Sammamish, Washington. So without even saying Sammamish, let's see what comes back. Oh, scoring test, what did I do? Oh, maybe put in the right index name. Send. And here we have five bedrooms. And hopefully, if I'm lucky, uh, yep, homes that are, are in the Sammamish location. Can you have a question? Applying weights to the bed field would be overridden if the user chooses to search ascending or descending on bed. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, so the, the first thing that we're, um, I'm just going to repeat that in case anyone didn't hear that. So uh, the question was uh, relating to filtering. So yes, the very first thing we're going to do is the, the filter is going to override the start. So if I say, uh, you know, less than, less than two bedrooms, but I give more weighting to five, you know, the, the five bedrooms, I'm still only going to see homes that are, you know, two or less, but it's going to apply that weighting to items that are, like, say, two. So, yes, to answer your question, the filter is the first thing that would be the overriding factor to this. Great question. So, you know, hopefully you've gotten a good idea on how to start building out a great search experience. If you have some content and you want to build out this type of application, this is a great way to start. Please keep in mind we do have that free search service. And for those of you that want to learn a little bit more um, and you want to go through some of the other samples, lesson two and lesson three is basically what we've we've walked through today. But if you want to see some more interesting things where, you know, what we can do is we can add in even more intelligence where you can do things like more like this. And what we do is we show things such as as people are searching for homes, you know, maybe using the content or the text within that, find me homes that are similar to it. And that's a very simple way to find alternate items. Some great capabilities. If you want to walk through the videos, I have all of these videos that go through each of these different things in a lot more detail. So with that, I do want to really thank all of you for taking the time to join me today. And what I'd like to do is open up the, the line to see if there's any uh, questions that I can answer.
we're going to stay online uh, for the next little while, so please, if you have any other questions, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to answer those online. But once again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My uh, Twitter handle is LiamCA, L-I-A-M-C-A. Um, feel free to ask me any questions that you like as you start trying this out. Thanks for your time. Excellent. Thank you once again, everyone. And uh, Liam, we do have one question. I think in the, um, the question window, is there a way we can do search on an OR basis? Uh, so yeah, so um, yeah, Heidi's actually answering that, yes. So okay. what we do is uh, we do, through our filtering, you know, all the, the standard things that you would expect, ands, ors, you can even do brackets around it to really uh, do various different types of filtering. All of those types of capabilities are available in our, our search queries. So I, I think that might be it. Yep. All right. Okay. Thanks again for, for uh, having me on today. Absolutely. Thanks for, for doing this for us. And thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day.